I should tell you first about the genesis of this theory, I suppose is the right way of putting it. Um, when I was about your age, and that was back in the early 80s or thereabouts, um, and this was particularly true around 1984, but it was true before that too. Um, you know, every generation has its worries, <clears throat> real or imagined, and the primary worry for people of my generation was the nuclear war. And, you know, it was a genuine worry. Um, at one point, many years later, I went down to Arizona to visit an ICBM, a decommissioned ICBM nuclear missile silo. And I, the ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, were very large rockets, right? They flew, they could fly halfway around the world. And it was deep underground and behind very, very thick steel doors. It was light green, you know that pastel green that <clears throat> everyone seemed to like in the 1950s? It was like pastel green Star Trek console. That's what it looked like. And uh, so we went down, out in the yard, it was in the desert, out in the yard there was a very, I would say, magical object, for lack of a better word. And that was the nose cone <coughs> for the IC, I, ICBM. And it was quite big, about that big, about that high, pointed like the point of a bullet about three quarters of, inch, of an inch thick plastic, you know, a kind of a resin and it was designed to melt on re-entry so that was just sitting there so that was fairly thought-provoking, let's put it that way and then we went into the missile silo interestingly enough, appended to the front of it, it had been decommissioned under Reagan by the way in the front of it, there was a, like a museum with artifacts from the 1980s featuring Reagan and, and Gorbachev <clears throat> meeting multiple times and it was staffed by these southern, these Americans from the south who were grandparent age and they were, they were just super friendly and you know they were happy to be in the museum, it was like going to visit your, your grandma's nuclear missile silo and so it was jarring, you know, because it's obviously a portentous place, and yet it was conjoined with hospitality and welcoming it was surreal in that manner anyways, we went into the into the silo and uh, they ran us through a simulated launch so imagine a panel like this, made out of metal, except twice as long with another one of these things at the other end 16 feet across or so basically 1950s technology <clears throat> but updated and then imagine that what you had to do to launch it was that there was a guy with a key and there was another guy with a key and if I remember correctly the keys were around their necks although I don't think they were stored around their necks permanently but and so to launch the missile you had to put the key in the lock both of you that was the safety precaution it had to be two of you you put the key in the lock and hold it for 10 seconds and then away the missile goes, and it wasn't as big, the missile wasn't as big as the rockets that went to the moon but it was plenty big, you know, the, the silo itself would have easily been as wide as this room is and perhaps larger and many many stories tall, you know, because it was nested underground so they ran us through a simulated launch, which was surreal, I would say, and then they told us that someone asked, and they said, the keys were in once now, they wouldn't tell us when, but you know, that would have been during the Cuban Missile Crisis because we were that close and we were close again at other times, although perhaps not that close and there seemed to be another peak of conflict in 1984 when there was a movie showed at that time called the day after, which at that time 
garnered more views than any movie ever had on, on TV and it was a story about the aftermath of a nuclear war and the people who were left and it was pretty realistic and, and pretty frightening and it, it turned out, as I found out later, that that movie actually was one of the things that influenced Ronald Reagan to put pressure on or negotiate with the Soviets, depending on how you look at it and so, well, and then, you know, five years later the Soviet Union collapsed no one saw that coming um, and it really didn't collapse in 1989 in some sense, you know, like a huge machine like that doesn't fall apart all at once, it falls apart over time and then at some point it just becomes unsustainable and topples and, you know, it's like they lost faith in their doctrine and, and, and for good reason, 